read any bio on Bill Such in the words, Intellectual and thinker are regular recounts about the man lauded in death as a champion of New Zealand, a man of vision, an influencer at a time when influencers could make real social change, didn't just do makeup and push up challenge videos. Incredible, given what we know today, he still has his supporters in high places as well. They like to portray his detractors, like me, as being politically motivated rather than realists. Let us skip such as childhood and get to the end of the 1920s and early 30s when all sorts of people look to communism as a political system worthy of consideration given the Great Depression had taken the shine off capitalism. One of those was Such, who was travelling the globe in 1932 after studying economics at Columbia University, came back to NZ, got married, then remarried a decade later. His new wife, Shirley Smith, a lawyer, also dabbled in left-wing doctrines. The career public servant ended up as New Zealand's Secretary General at the United Nations after working for them in Sydney at the close of the war. On the cocktail circuit in New York, he got tied in with Marxist economists Leo Huberman and Paul Sweezy. Such his name came up in intel regarding Peter and Helen Kruger's passport scandal, their subsequent unmasking as Soviet spies, what was termed the Portland spy ring. Despite holding valid New Zealand passports, Peter and Helen Kruger weren't actually from Auckland as the first page stated. They were really Lorna and Morris Cohen from New York. The FBI told the New Zealand authorities about their suspicions on such that he was involved with the same Russian spy network in the early 50s. At this point, one could suggest this was a typical over-the-top guilt by association by a department run by J. Edgar Hoover, who saw red under every bed. Even the best apologists must admit, though, William wasn't making good choices in Friends. The innocent answer could also be that he was simply a raving quixotic, like the intrigue of playing secret agents, and got enthralled by his first book by Ian Fleming. Certainly he was full of himself, arrogant in the extreme, was prone to engaging in Walter Mitty-like claims. Like on his trip in the early 30s, where he had walked solo to the North Pole, slept in the tundra in Lapland, and gone alone by foot from Russia via Afghanistan to India. Apparently so. Of course, picking up a watchtower doesn't make one a Jehovah's Witness, now does it? Nor does penning a radio broadcast praising the Russians as liberators of Eastern Europe, pissing up at the Russian embassy in Wellington, and then going against specific government instructions on one vote at the UN, inciting instead with the Eastern Europeans regarding the invasions of Hungary. All of that doesn't make you a communist, just rather suspect. Nor does debating politics with Russian diplomats in strange places necessarily make you a spy either, at least not according to the jury. What was a better explanation as to why a retired Korea public servant came to be meeting a thinly veiled KGB agent on a wet and wild Wellington night with the New Zealand Police and Security Intelligence Service clandestinely watching all the proceedings, including the dodgy toilets I might add. The boring post offices, they stumbled upon each other like they were ex-schoolmates. When the two were busted at the park, the Russian and such both scarpered, whereas Gavorov had a waiting merc from the Russian embassy nearby to whisk him away, weighed down somewhat by the package such had passed to him. Bill wasn't as lucky, or as a fleet as foot. Soon such was facing questioning. What are you doing there, Billy boy? His immediate excuse? I was discussing Zionism. For a man blessed with such apparent intellect, a strategic thinker, that has to be one of the lamest replies in the history of police questioning. This was a bloke who at stages was a head of the Department of Industries and Commerce, worked at the office of the Minister of Finance and headed New Zealand delegation to the United Nations. Nor did it go far enough to explain to the police why this was the fourth time he had happened upon the same Russian. The other three occurrences he denied outright, 
claimed he never knew anyone by the name Dmitry Rezgovorov, despite the overwhelming evidence and sharing a public toilet with him a few hours previous, photographs and that sort of thing. Thus, Such was now facing charges under New Zealand's Official Secrets Act, and before he ended up in court, his arrogance got the better of him. He took up the offers of appearing on a current affairs program called Seven Days in a bizarre contradictory interview which must have had his defence team squirming. Such suggested that the Russian was looking to defect. The single meeting he'd originally claimed in the police interviews had turned into meetings plural. Wanted New Zealanders to believe that he was innocent. It was normal for him to engage in long random walks late at night in any sort of weather. He had been contacted in his capacity as the New Zealand head of the Friends of Israel. Nothing to do with his other roles. The only thing he had talked about was the threat of Zionism. It was a harmless topic and brought about the clandestine meetings. All the cafes were full. There was one major hurdle the prosecution faced at the 1975 trial. There was no actual evidence of what the contents of the exchange were. There was no way of proving, for example, that it wasn't, say, a penthouse in that bundle, the key witness having long since scarpered back to Russia. It was therefore little surprise such was proven not guilty, and circumstantial evidence alone didn't stick. Despite all the suspicions, many held that such was a spy, or at least somehow foolishly got entangled with the KGB somewhere along the track. The most damning solid evidence would not come out till many years later after his death. That evidence came from two strong sources. The most unlikely of those were contained in the pages of a book penned by New Zealand author Sarah Gaitanos. That book was a biography entitled Shirley Smith, An Examined Life, which came out in 2019. Such was always the darling of the left, along with his wife, Helen Clark, for example, was a swooning devotee of the couple. Little wonder, therefore, the New Zealand's current Minister of Finance, Grant Robinson, launched the book, in the pages of which contained a series of bombshell revelations. After Bill's death, Gaitanas outlined how Shirley had received a strange rate bill from the Bahamas, of all places. It was no mistake. Unbeknownst to her, the couple owned a property in the Caribbean. Then there were two other rates invoices issued on houses he, or they, owned in Kapiti in Auckland. Bill also had a separate bank account, with a whopping 5 million smackaroos floating around. For good measure, a Swiss bank account also came to light. These are not really the accumulated trappings of a career public servant. Moreover, why keep this all secret from your wife of 40 years, if you had simply made a judicious stock market or investment decision? Why the need for a retired New Zealand civil servant to hold a Swiss bank account? On the other hand, applying a smidgen of Occam's razor, one could conclude, if say you were running a spy network in New Zealand, you were hardly going to walk into the local Bank of New Zealand and deposit wads of cash into your moles account, now are you? Then there's a thorny issue of how this fortune was hidden, not just from the wife, but the authorities. A man of such as status had surely declared his offshore property interest to the Inland Revenue. Well, no. The Inland Revenue Department got to know one W.B. Such very well. He had the distinction of being the second highest tax surveyor in the whole country in the years between 1966 and 1974. Certainly he knew how to spend other people's money. He wasn't that keen on contributing towards the larger pot, though. By then, though, most reasonable New Zealanders already knew such was a Russian spy. The two revelations from Gaitanos's books had been, clearly, Shirley wasn't entirely aware of a hubby's shadowy extracurricular activities, at least to be charitable, the depth of them, plus the significant fortune and blood money as such had accrued over 25 years selling his country out. The fact he was a spy was already well known and truly out of the bag by 2019. Back in 2014, the now faint chance the late Bill Such had been falsely maligned in a posthumous witch hunt in the decades following his trial would be put to rest with the opening of the Matraukin files. 
Major Vasily Mithralkin had defected to the West in 1994. A senior KGB archivist had come to the good guys with a veritable gold mine of Russian secrets. Three massive trunk loads, some of which were scribbled into school books. Not least, who was on the Russian payroll, country by country. In 2014, these were opened and revealed to the entire world. If you are good at Russian and can afford the sign-up, they are there online today to peruse. Not unexpectedly, his dossier on New Zealand wasn't terribly big. Three odd pages, including a former Labour MP who hasn't been identified to my knowledge. One of the main New Zealand recruits was a man given the code name Maori. The details on the operative Maori were listed and included the birth date which is bang on, or such. The date he was recruited, which was 1950 and fits in entirely when such was in New York. His profession outside espionage. It even got down to the date he left the job, which I left off that list and looking at. And that also fits entirely with Bill Such's bio. Short of putting the name, William Ball Such, in the file along with the passport photo. It was him, a perfect match, bingo quarter of a century in the pocket of the Russians and signed his life away in New York whilst representing New Zealand at the United Nations. At the very same time the FBI were tailing Huberman, Sweezy and the Portland mob, the likely ones he sorted out passports for. I mean what better source could you get? The Russians own state spy apparatus. The KGB are not exactly renowned for publishing works of fiction. The conclusion was all too obvious. He was a traitor. And picture the police prosecutor in 1975 broaching these curly questions during the cross-examination. Could you please tell the court about your Bahaman property you kept secret from your wife, Mr. Such? Can you please account for the monies in your offshore and onshore banking accounts? How is it a man fitting your exact details appears in KGB files? One person who certainly agrees with the balance of evidence in my appraisal is Kit Bennett. And Bennett was one of those who got to interview Such all those years ago when he was in his early 20s. He has penned a book about what is now called the Such Affair. It is called simply Spy. That's because Bill Such was a spy, one that got away with his crime, selling out New Zealand may well have died from having his neck lengthened rather than cancer, had the full extent of his activities been available to the prosecution team back in 75. Despite all this overwhelming evidence, the bio of such on such places as Wikipedia asserts there is some sort of debate over him being involved with the Russians at all. You also have a former New Zealand Prime Minister and the current New Zealand finance minister willing to turn a blind eye and pseudo intellectuals are rabbiting on about how he was a visionary introduced free milk to schools not the messy bits about the Swiss bank accounts gulags such was fully conversant of Stalin's atrocities the pogroms did little to stifle his enthusiasm that communism was the go remained a staunch Marxist termed Stalin's mass murders as a necessity. The debate as to whether he was guilty effectively ended in 2014. The three questions that still need answering are what information did he pass on that could solicit those sort of backhanders? Why was he allowed to keep his job when there was such a large cloud of suspicion hanging over him for so long? And what did Shirley Smith really know about his activities? She denied his involvement in espionage her entire life. From what I can grasp, their daughter suggests it was all a stitch up by the KGB. A large set of unfortunate circumstances. And her father was in fact a loyal New Zealander who saw the need to own a holiday home in the Caribbean and not the Coromandel. And back to her mum. As far as we know, Shirley didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Her hubby hanging around parks on wet Wellington nights discussing Zionism with KGB agents, comfortable with him donning long raincoats and lurking in seedy public toilets. 
in respect to her involvement and knowledge of his entire activities, you can come to your own conclusions. If anyone knows what happened to his ill-gotten gains, let us know in the comments. Thanks for spending a quarter of an hour with us today. It is appreciated. I will spot you next time. Bye for now.